Hey everyone, we're so glad that you've tuned in for this message today. I believe God gave me a word for you and I believe the word of God is going to bring you strength. I believe God's going to bring someone comfort and take someone to a new level. I want you to watch this message that the Lord gave me and at the end, I'm gonna come back and we're gonna pray for you. God bless you, enjoy this word. Acts chapter two, verse number one. I'm not going to take real long today. In fact, I almost taught right at the end of that outpouring. I was trying to find the mind of God and just measure the moment and see what God was saying because I could have very easily just segued right into this teaching. And uh, it just fit, it fits so appropriately with what I felt like God laid on my heart for this morning and what God is doing. I, I just want to say this first of all. This is Pentecost Sunday. How many knew that before you walked in the room? Yeah. So it's Pentecost Sunday. This is the Sunday some churches make room for the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, and, and I don't say that critically. It's just like he's only the Holy Ghost on Pentecost Sunday. But the reality of it is the dove of heaven has been trying to get out of the cage of religion. And if the church will just let the dove free, the dove will do powerful things. We don't serve a little God. We serve a mighty God. How many know he's an all-powerful God? And there is, there, is a, there is a work happening in the earth, in, the, in and among the people of God. I don't want to miss it. I don't want you to miss it. And by the grace of God, we're not going to miss it. Amen? Acts chapter 2, verse 1. I love taking this text. And, and this is, uh, as I said earlier, explanatory. Today is a teaching. It's, it's a helping us to understand because... One of the things I recognize my assignment is as a pastor is to help break people out of mentalities and even modes of operation that religion has imposed on us. You know, you can get religious and not even want to be religious. I can get religious and not want to be religious. But, but if we just find ourselves in a rut believing and, and, and only believing what we've only always heard, then we can, we can actually limit ourselves because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if you're thinking, uh, if your thinking is, is, is simply a product of what you've always been taught, you may not be able to think above and beyond where you've always been. But the Spirit of the Lord will give uh, his men and women a word. And the word is meant to bring a spirit of wisdom and revelation and enlightenment to your heart so you can step out of limitations that you have previously been bound in and step into the outpouring and the blessing that God has for you. And I simply say that because as God continues to bless our church and grow it, people who have never been part of a charismatic Pentecostal church come in here and think, what is going on? And I'm not intimidated by those questions. Neither was Peter intimidated in the book of Acts, the second chapter. People started saying, these men are drunk. Peter said, no, 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 it's 9 o'clock in the morning. People don't get drunk in the morning. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit. And so he explains it because he doesn't want people not to be able to enter the moment simply because they don't know. And I don't want anyone to come to a church and like the atmosphere but never step into the one who causes the atmosphere. We are, not, we are not excited and free because we're Pentecostal. We are Pentecostal and excited and free because the one who brings freedom is in this building and has been moving since we came up on the property today. So, so the Holy Ghost is not a flavor. The Holy Spirit is not an option. In many places, it's optional if the Spirit of God, but you can't, you can't make God optional. It is not just God the Father and God the Son. It is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the last few weeks we've been able to be reminded of the one that many tried to forget. He is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Acts 2, 1 through 4. Let's jump right in. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost, I, I, I need you to underline this next phrase had fully come, underlined fully come. That's where I'm going today. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting 
And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody in the room got filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I want to talk today for a few minutes about living in the overflow. Look at somebody, tell them neighbor. Come on, tell them like you love them. Neighbor, you and I, you and I, and everybody who came with you is intended to live in the overflow. In the name of the Lord. Bless the people in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, I preach this text on days other than Pentecost Sunday. I have preached it many times from this pulpit because I believe it is central to the understanding of what it means to be a Pentecostal church. When you come to this house or you go to other places, you... you you have heard this phrase, that's a Pentecostal church. When somebody asks me what denomination we are, I say we are a Pentecostal, full gospel, full gospel, charismatic, Pentecostal church. And when you say that, they immediately, most people, even those who just dabble in religion, when you say you are a Pentecostal, it goes from zero to 60 like that. It's like, oh, you want to, they don't say it, but they look at you like one of them kind of people. (laughs) And I understand that because we live in a natural world and we think we serve a natural God and we go many times to a natural church. And we sing natural songs and we preach natural sermons and we do natural ministry and all that's wonderful. But somewhere in this world, in this moment we're living in, we need some supernatural. And Pentecost is the inaugural moment where God said, I'm not just going to have one Messiah who is leading just 12. This one Messiah, Jesus, is coming back to heaven. And when he comes back to heaven, the Holy Ghost is going to come to earth And God the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit is going to begin to move upon the planet. Before the Holy Spirit came, (coughs) Jesus alone operated as the body of Christ in the flesh. It is why he said in John, it is expedient for you, necessary for you. It is best for you that I go. Because if I don't go, the comforter cannot come. But when I go back, I'm going to tag him. How many of you ever watched wrestling growing up? Uh huh, the tag team matches. It was illegal for both men to be in the ring at the same time. So, in order for the other partner to be able to enter the ring, the one in the ring had to go over and tag the neighbor, the the partner. And when he tagged them, they swapped places and the one outside of the ring entered the ring. Y'all know this, man. If you watched wrestling back in the 80s when it was real, I don't know about all this stuff happening in today's world, but this stuff that happened back in the 80s, it was real. And when they would tag each other, they would swap places. That is what happened When the Spirit of God came, Jesus got on a cloud in Acts chapter 1 and he ascended to the Father and when he got to heaven, he said to the Holy Ghost, now it's your turn and the Spirit of God invaded the earth in an upper room in the second chapter of Acts because God did not believe that the earth would be able to to, to see the kingdom unless there were a people who were full of the Spirit of God and they would be ambassadors of that kingdom from which the Spirit came. We have stepped into a time and are living in a moment of outpouring. And what I find interesting about this text is that the Bible says when the day, the day, everybody say the day, 
the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost, now you must understand something. Let me explain this for everybody in the room. This was a day, but it happened in a feast. There's a reason why they were all assembled in Jerusalem here in Acts chapter 2. They did not come for revival. They got revival, but they came for a feast. It was a feast, don't miss it, that was 1,500 years old. It actually began in the book of Exodus 50 days after Passover. Everybody say Passover. You know what Passover was? It was the moment when the death angel passed through Israel, uh, passed through Egypt, and the Bible said that God spoke to Moses, told him to kill a lamb, take the blood of the lamb with hyssop, put the blood over the doorposts, the door of the homes they lived in in Egypt. He said, put the door, put the blood over the doorpost, Moses. Tell them to put the blood. Every family needs a lamb. Every family needs the blood. Put the blood over the doorpost. And when the death angel passes through Egypt, I'm going to smite the firstborn of Egypt. But if I see the blood, I will pass over you. Boy, we used to sing that song growing up in the church. Y'all may not remember that one. When I see the blood, when I see, the, anybody know that song? We used to sing it growing up in the church. The whole, the ladies shouted all over the place and the brothers got down and wept because there's power in the blood of the lamb. And when the death angel and the enemy and darkness come to your house, you better have more than a church membership. You better have more than a Bible with dust on it sitting up on the coffee table. When the enemy comes by your house, you better make sure you got the blood applied. Not the blood of Buddha, not the blood of Allah, not the blood of religion, but the blood of the lamb. And I want to tell you that the lamb is not on the way. The lamb has already come. And I need to testify on my way to my assignment today that the blood of the lamb still works. The blood will keep the devil off your children. The blood will keep the devil out of your mind. The blood will keep the devil out of your body. The blood of Jesus has power. I don't know about you, but I'm here today because of the blood. Had it not been for the blood I'd have lost my mind had it not been for the blood I would have lost my way had it not been for the blood COVID might have took me out last year but I need to pray I need to praise God today for the blood everybody in here saved out of praise him for the blood you ought to be thankful that on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross it is the blood that kept you But I didn't come to preach on the blood. After the blood was put on the doorpost and the death angel passed over 50 days from that night. 50, everybody say 50. That's what Pentecost means, it means 50. And for 49 days, they measured every day. Devin taught this a year ago, it's called counting the Omer. And they counted the Omer. And what you must understand is that the feasts of the Old Testament and the holy days of the Old Testament are trying to paint a prophetic picture that would lead us to an understanding of the ministry and the totality of the person of Christ. If you think Jesus just pranced up on the scene in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have not read Genesis through Malachi with a spirit of wisdom and revelation because everything that happens in Genesis through Malachi, oh God, if I had the time, it was pointing to a man who would come through a virgin womb and would become the Lamb of God. Everything about the prophets and the, and the kings and the judges and the patriarchs and the Torah, all of it points to Jesus. And the feast, you know, seven feasts, we're going to teach on that later this fall, but the feast all point to the man and the ministry of Christ Jesus our Lord. And the Passover, you understand, the Passover was the, the, the reminding us of the sin and the bondage and the slavery we were all in. And yet one came, the lamb, the blood was shed through the lamb and the lamb came to set us all free. And then 49 days after this Passover feast came the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Passover. They are both and the same. Don't miss it. For 1,500 years, 
They celebrated in some form or fashion, and over the period of those 1,500 years, the celebration changed. But the feast was a feast unto God forever. And so although the feast and the way they celebrated and commemorated it may have changed, the feast was kept because the feast was put on the calendar of God by God himself. And you may not be Jewish, but you better know what kind of calendar God operates by. And so the Bible says in Exodus and in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy that something powerful would happen on this feast of weeks or feast of Passover. They would bring a first fruit and they would cut this sheath off and they would cut the wheat off and the wheat is superior to barley. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't bring God what was convenient. They would bring God what is best. And watch this, they would, they would bring this sheath unto the Lord and they would thank him for the first fruit that came up from the ground. And it was a risk to give this offering. Because essentially what they were saying is, I'm going to take some of what I could have eaten, but instead I'm going to offer it to God. You must understand that when God asks you for something, and I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about anything you got. Time, talent, treasure, testament, whatever it is you got. When God asks you for something, he will never ask you for something you don't have, but he will often ask you for what you want to keep. And for a farmer, bringing this first fruit to God was a bit of a risk because they didn't know. Well, let me say it this way. They knew this. Without God, there would be no more harvest. We're the people who understand that without God, there won't be no more harvest. Well, I got a great job. We're the people who understand that great jobs are a product of the blessing of the Lord. Is anybody in here, honestly, in a job that you probably are not qualified enough to have, I'm not, I'm not talking about against qualification. You ought to be able to educate yourself and qualify yourself as much as you can. But I just believe I serve a God who no matter how much you prepare, he'll always bless you beyond your preparation and take you beyond your ability because what kind of glory does God get if you can take credit for the life you got? What if God wanted to bless you with such a harvest that when it got through with you, everybody looking at you said, I know where he came from. I know where she came from. And there is no way but God for her and for him to have what that you're looking at somebody like that. It's a harvest. It wasn't just a harvest of tangible things, however. The harvest was a prophetic declaration of the harvest of souls that were coming in. It was, it was the first fruit. It was the, it was the beginning, but it was not the end of harvest. This is where we got to, we got to get some understanding in the church. We think harvest is seasonal. In the kingdom, harvest is perpetual. I'm not just, I'm not just going to live one month out of the year believing it's harvest time. I do believe there are times when God speaks prophetically and he puts a, a spotlight on a certain thought or a certain thing he is doing. I get all that. And there have been times we walked to this pulpit and said the next three months are full of harvest. But I want to tell you right now, there, there is a people that God is raising up who understand that, that, that harvest is not just something you visit occasionally. Harvest is something we see step into perpetually because he is not the Lord of what used to be. He is the Lord of the harvest now. Jesus told the disciples, look on the field. The fields are white and ready for harvest now. The only thing missing are laborers. I present to you, family, that some churches are not experiencing harvest of souls, not because it's not their season, but because God can't find any servants who will go into the field. Y'all not helping nobody today. We, we blame the lack of harvest on not being our season. 
When in reality, if we would all do the work of an evangelist, today at lunch could become harvest time. And today at the gas station could become harvest time. And tomorrow when you go into your work and sit at your cubicle, it might be harvest time. You say, Pastor, I ain't seen nobody get saved in a while. Well, I have. And the reason we have is because harvest is always in effect. He is the Lord of the harvest. And when the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of of Weeks, same thing, when it happened, it was a prophetic announcement of what was on the way. But every Pentecost in the Old Testament, every promise of the Spirit in the Old Testament was preparing us for the fulfillment and the inauguration of of the day of Pentecost, don't miss it, fully coming. I hope this makes sense. This is how I feel like God showed it to me. 1500, actually 1451 BC, the first Pentecost, the first feast happened. 1500, almost 1500 years a Pentecostal feast. Another hundred years. Another hundred years. A prophet named Zechariah. A prophet named Habakkuk. A prophet named Isaiah. A prophet named Ezekiel. All of them kept saying, a day is coming when the Spirit will be poured out on your sons and daughters. The Spirit will be poured out on the house of Israel. The Spirit will be poured out upon the people. Uh, In Ezekiel, he said that I'm going to put a new heart in you and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone. And 1,500 years of God pouring in the cup of Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now let me explain something before I make myself happy. (laughs) When the Bible said fully come, everybody underlined that word fully come. Because in the Greek, it is one word. This is what the Lord, Lord, I feel something happening right here. In the Greek, it is the Greek word soon play ra'o. Everybody say soon play ra'o. Soon play ra'o, and it's only used, that word is only used three times in the whole Bible, and every time that word soon play ra'o is used, it is used by Dr. Luke. He uses that word twice in the book of Luke and once here in the book of Acts. This is so crazy. When you look at the use of soon play ra'o in Luke 8 and in Luke 9, watch this, in Luke 8, Lord, I'm getting ready to bless myself, in Luke 8, he uses the word soon play ra'o to describe the boat that was in the middle of the storm and the waves were filling the boat. And literally the boat is about to sink because the water is soon play ra'o. It is filling up the boat. Jesus, I I hope you're catching this. And then over in, help me Lord, Luke 9, it says in verse 51, and it came to pass when the time was soon play ra'o that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. All his life, every moment was about filling up the cup of him going to Jerusalem. In the moment where the boat was sinking, every moment of the storm was about the water filling up the boat. And now we get here to Acts chapter 2. And for 1,500 years, Jewish families have filled the cup of Pentecost with with honoring and commemorating the the, the feast of the Lord and they bring their first fruit and they bring their sheath 
and they make two uh, two loaves of bread of leavened bread and they bring it to the priest and the priest weighs it. In fact, I found out this week, this is crazy, that when the feast, uh, uh, Ryan and Casey, if you were a Jewish family and you were honoring the feast of Pentecost, you and Casey, Ryan, and the babies would bring two loaves of leavened bread to the priest. And here's what the priest would do. He would, he would turn and wave it to the north. He would wave it to the south. He would wave it to the east. And he would wave it to the west. And then he'd wave it up to heaven. And then he'd bring it back down and wave it in the earth. Somebody said, why did he wave it? Well, if you understand the power of the two loaves. Oh, I feel like preaching right here. One loaf represented the Gentiles. And the other loaf represented the Jewish nation. And what the priest was prophetically announcing is that there's coming a harvest one day. Oh, yes. It's not just a Jewish harvest. It's going to be a Gentile harvest. And I want you to announce to everybody that from the north to the south, from the east to the west, from the, from the western hemisphere to the eastern hemisphere, from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, on heaven, on earth, there is nobody who is outside the scope of this harvest that, oh, I came to preach about an international outpouring. I came to preach about a multinational outpouring. This ain't just a Jewish thing. This is an all ye people kind of thing. Everybody, you know, your mama and all of them, everybody can be saved. Slap somebody, tell them it's about harvest time. Yes, it is. I want to thank God that Jews are coming in, but I want to praise him that Gentiles are coming in. He grafted us in. Oh, yes, he did by the blood of his son. Hallelujah. Woo, watch. I'm almost through. 1,500 years of fulfilling Pentecostal commemoration and remembering the faithfulness of God. But it still wasn't full. 1,500 years almost of going to the temple and bringing offering. 1,500 years of going to Jerusalem and giving God thanks for his faithfulness in their field. Anybody got a field with some harvest in it? Slap your neighbor, tell him you better be thankful. You better be thankful. Don't come up in here with some cute praise on Sunday. Don't come up in here acting like you deserve what you have. You ought to be thankful when you come in to the house of the Lord. When the Jewish people carried their offering for Pentecost, they carried it with tears streaming down their cheeks. Oh, baby, come on. We're going to Jerusalem. Daddy, where are we going? We're going to give God thanks for what he's already put in our field. I'm, uh, yeah, Aaron, help me for a minute here. Can I find just about five or ten families for about 10 or 15 seconds who are thankful for what's already grown in your field what's already happened what's already happening in your life why don't you turn around and tell your neighbor say hey neighbor let me offer you an explanation real quick it ain't because of who I know it ain't because of what I did it ain't because of how savvy I've been I'm the head and not the tail I'm blessed when I come in and blessed when I go out not because I deserve it but because I put a seed in the ground and God gave me harvest somebody give him praise Basha, 1,500 years. <laughs> and it ain't full yet. All those years of announcing what was coming, but it ain't full yet. Soon play Rao is about to happen in Acts chapter 2. The culmination of 1,500 years of honoring God and commemorating the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Weeks and Pentecost. Watch this. They had seen him resurrect. They had seen him ascend on a cloud. Before he steps on a cloud and goes back to heaven, 
He said, go to Jerusalem and tarry and wait there until you get clothed in power from on high. And they go there and they don't know, I feel the Lord. They go there and they don't know that in their waiting they have joined 1,500 years of waiting. They have joined 1,500 years of moments of honoring and commemorating God. And now they come to an upper room and they get hungry to see the fulfillment of a promise. I want you to know I feel the Lord on me right here. I want you to know some of you have stepped into a bowl that is almost full. You have stepped into a moment. I'm telling you this thing is at the top. You think you just showed up today and we showed up here with, oh no. There have been some mamas and daddies in Israel and in the faith that have been praying and fasting and they wept over us. They cry. You, you don't understand. This didn't just happen here today. There are some people that before, they're in heaven right now and we're stepping in to the reward of all their prayers and the reward of all their pouring out and what getting ready to happen in the earth is not just because you're here it's because generations oh God over the years generations over the decades over the centuries God has found a remnant people who just keep honoring him and when the day of Pentecost fully come what is that pastor what is that that is soon play rao the cup couldn't hold anymore and so now I feel the Lord on me. Now, the only thing that can happen is that the promise and the power begin to overflow. In other words, I'm going to get ready to say, I'm going to say something to y'all. You're not going to believe I'm getting ready to say, but I don't need another prophecy about what's on the way. I already know. Y'all missing what I'm saying? Woo! You're missing what I'm saying. I don't need another prophecy telling me that a great revival's coming. There is no other option but an outpouring because every prophecy has already been I'm getting ready to run. I said I'm getting ready to do something. I just want to tell some religious somebody. I'm not waiting on another prophet to tell me an outpouring is coming. He poured it out in Acts 2 and the devil doesn't know how to turn it off. Slap your neighbor, tell the neighbor, let it overflow. Let him overflow. You don't need somebody to lay hands on you. All you need to get is a revelation that this. This is. This. This. See that rim? That's the last days. We have forever projected the last days as an evil time. Now I want to tell you there's some bad stuff going to happen in the last days. But we missed something. My Bible said in the book of Acts chapter 2 when Peter started explaining this outpouring of the Holy Ghost they said these men are drunk. Peter hopped up and said I'm over here in the 17th verse these men are not drunk as you suppose. Seeing it is but the ninth hour of the day. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Here's what that means. 
Can I make an announcement to you? A theological, eschatological announcement. The last days are not coming. I'm just telling you what the Bible said. And it shall come to pass in the last days. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. The last days are not coming. The last days started when the Holy Ghost was poured out. Which means this. Every day since then and every day until he returns is a last day. And I know the Bible said that in the last days, perilous times shall come. I know that the Bible said in the last days, men would be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. But I want to tell you that not only are the dark things going to get darker, in the end, I'm good right now, in the end, the Bible said God would pour his spirit out in the So every time I come to church, every time I come to church, why y'all so, you and Devin and y'all are so like, (laughs) calm down. You calm down if you want to calm down. I woke up this morning not waiting on a promise. I woke up in the fulfillment of a promise. understand what I'm teaching you? You don't need somebody else to come along and tell you it's time. God already turned the dial in your direction and the Spirit of God will always be poured out till Jesus comes. Well, I'm waiting on revival. No, you're not. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. Because soon play rao has already happened. The day of Pentecost is not fully coming. It has fully. And let me tell you what's getting ready to happen in the hearts of the hungry. They're getting ready to step into a revelation that we're in the days of outpouring. And every time we come together, every time, come on, stand with me, I'm through teaching. Every time we come together, every time we worship, I believe God values sensitivity. Before the night, just play something. Anointed Disney. Just anointed Disney. That's the feeling. (laughs) He knows what I mean. (laughs) In 2014, when the 90 day revival hit, there was no sensitivity in my spirit. I walked in that door knowing, 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 knowing where we were going and when we would end. There's nothing wrong with having a plan. There's nothing wrong with practicing your plan. There's nothing wrong with executing the plan. In fact, I always tell the team, plan it and execute what you planned until God Or something fresh. I want to even say something a little deeper. I'm not waiting on revival. Now I need revival in my nation. But there's a problem if a church has to have a revival every year. Or y'all not gonna like me for this. Do you understand what the word revival means? It means to bring back to life something that was dead. Well, my question is, when did you die?
Let's, let's use some different language moving forward. How about we stay in a culture of awakening where we stay awake and alive and we don't have to come to church and be revived. Let it overflow. 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 You ready for this? The church isn't going backwards. <laughs> I think some people would get happy if we went pre-Pentecost. Just waiting on the Lord to return. That's what pre-Pentecost church looks like. Remember? Remember? Acts chapter 1 verse 8. They're all, they're all watching Jesus. And he gets on a cloud and goes up into heaven. And the angels have to come snap him out of it. Ye men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing? This same Jesus which was taken from you shall so come again in like manner as you have seen him go. But you've got a promise. And the promise is not to stand on the side of this hill and simply wait on his return. The promise is to get filled and endued with power. I want to pray for people today who feel like their cup is empty or maybe it's just half full. You don't need a promise or another prophecy. Soon play ra'o has already happened. Pentecost is not something coming. Pentecost has already been accomplished. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost is not something that happened one time. He did not play peekaboo. But, oh, let me come down and bless the church and run back to heaven. No, no, no. The Holy Ghost is still being poured out. And I feel like there are some people in this room today who came today. I know it's not everybody. I know it's 1208. And I know people are like, you know, this is summertime. Go do your thing. But let me, let me minister to somebody today who would say, Pastor Kevin, I need to step into overflow. Religion has caused me to live half empty and I'm ready to be an overflowing artesian well again. Maybe you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Do you understand that in the church there are three baptisms? Baptism into the body, baptism into water, and baptizing in the Holy Ghost. When you got born again, you got baptized into the body of Christ. When you got baptized in water, it was the outward sign of an inward work and you were testifying to the world that you who were dead in your sins went under the water in death but were raised in the newness of life. When you come up out of the baptism pool, it was a prophetic testimony of a life of resurrected power. That's why we tell people to get baptized, not because it's a denominational thing. Jesus got baptized. There's baptism into the body, baptism in water, but there's a baptism in the Holy Ghost. And here's what's beautiful. There are some people here say, I'm scared to death of the Holy Ghost. Do you understand who baptizes you in the Holy Ghost? It ain't the preacher. Do you know who baptizes you in the Holy Ghost? Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. That's why we preach him as the spirit baptizer. Now, anything Jesus has for me, I want it. I do. You say, Pastor, people make it so spooky. Listen, there's some crazy people in the kingdom of God. But don't let any of the people or the actions of the people cause you to confuse the people and their response to God's presence 
and make you think that that's the Holy Ghost. Because I know people who weep in the Holy Ghost, who shout in the Holy Ghost, who laugh in the Holy Ghost. I've seen people run around this church when the Holy Ghost hits them. Now, if you're going to run around this church, you better be in the Holy Ghost. Because halfway through, you're going to need some oxygen at that exit sign back there. But here's the reality of it. People respond all kinds of different ways to the power of God. If I brought an, out, an outlet up here and you touched, where's Duran at? Duran, lift your hand. First of all, let's thank God for Duran. Y'all remember three, hold on, let me tell you why. Three weeks ago when we almost didn't have church. How many remember that Sunday? There's one reason we had church that Sunday. That man stayed up literally from midnight till 8 a.m. with EPB. Had it not been for him, we wouldn't have church. So somebody, listen, this is true. Hold on, let me do something. Rich, I need you to get a $200 gift card to Ruth Chris for Duran and his wife. We're going to send them to Ruth Chris to say thank you for staying. Where's Mark? Is Mark here? Mark here? We get Mark and his, he got a girlfriend or something. Something, we'll get him a gift card too. He stayed too. Praise God. Here's the bottom line. <laughs> you, you touch 120 volts, you're going to move. Some of y'all might move a little, some of y'all might move a lot. The movement is not the power. It's a response to the power. And you are concerned that you're going to respond like you saw somebody else respond. Don't worry about how you react when it touches you. Just get the power. In fact, woof, this is what we call quickening. You ever seen somebody who just, I might sometimes happen to me, you're just operating and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost will hit you and you get, woof, quickened. We call that quickened. What was that? Power. Shooting through my spirit. You say, I didn't feel that. You're not the power source. You may never get quickened like that. You may never fall. You may never run. You may never shout. You may never, you may ne- don't worry about what you do. Just don't miss it because of what other people do. The beautiful thing about this house, we don't condemn how you respond or when or what it looks. Just take him in. How many want more of him? Lift your hands right now. Lift your hands. I want to take, it is 1211. For those who are thinking and wondering, I'm going to take the next four minutes and I believe God is going to fill every person in this room afresh with the Holy Ghost that has their hands up in the air. I, I know you have him. I'm not talking about if you, if, I'm talking about if you're hungry for God and if you want the Spirit of the Lord to fill you, just throw your hands up right now. God, I'm asking you to fill people with the Holy Spirit right now. I'm asking you to fill people afresh with the Holy Spirit right now. Somebody in this room is hopeless. Religion left their cup half full. Religion left them feeling like they couldn't. Religion left them feeling like their best is behind them. But the spirit of religion is broken right now. Come on, just open up your mouth. Open up your mouth and begin to praise God all over this room. Just begin to praise Him. Nobody ever got filled with the Holy Ghost that didn't want Him. And if you want Him, I just want you to begin to ask Him to fill you afresh with His Spirit. Fill us with power. Fill us with strength. Fill us with life. I thank you that the Holy Spirit has already been poured out. And today we're stepping into a fresh and a a new and a a, a different outpouring. It's not what you did last week, but it is the same God pouring it out. Do it again. Come on, reach over and lay your hand on your neighbor's shoulder. God's going to fill some people today. God's going to strengthen some people today. Listen to me right now. A spirit of weakness is being broken off the church. A spirit of carnality and love is being broken off the church a spirit of insecurity and fatherlessness is being broken off the church right now you're coming into fresh strength and fresh power receive you the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus a spirit of fear is being broken off of the church right now in the name of Jesus receive ye the Holy Ghost receive ye the Holy Ghost God break and snap every yoke of bondage break and snap every young come on keep praying keep praying people are beginning to receive break and snap every yoke of bondage let a spirit of weakness be broken today let a 
the spirit of defeat be broken off of them today. May the power of God rise up within them today. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water today. Oh, come on, keep praying. Come on, keep praying. The old saints used to say, hold on, hold on. Don't quit praying till you get what you came for. America needs a praying church. Your family needs a praying church. This city needs a praying church. The Bible said in Acts chapter 4 verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. I want somebody to call on the name of the Lord until it begins to fill you. We need the real thing, Lord. We need the real thing, Lord. We need the real thing, Lord. We don't want religion, God. We don't even want to talk in unknown tongues unless we're filled with your spirit. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 Some of y'all about to mess around and jump in the river. Some of you are about to mess around and jump straight in the river of God. Oh, it'll free you. It'll loose you from religious bondage. You ought not stand on the side of the river and watch it flow by. You ought to step into the river of God today and let the Holy Ghost fill you. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it in the name of Jesus. Do it in the name of Jesus. I praise you, God. Oh, I praise you. Friend, I believe God is speaking to hearts right now. This message, I pray, has stirred you. And there are some who are watching this message who are waiting on the opportunity to give their heart to Jesus Christ. Listen, the greatest day in your life is the day that you give your heart to Jesus Christ and allow him to become the Lord of your life. And if you want that opportunity, then right now I want to pray with you. You know, the Bible says in the book of Acts that God commands men and women everywhere to repent, to turn from their sin, and to turn to the living God. And the message of hope today for you is that no matter how messed up you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how far away from God you feel, He is only one prayer away. Would you turn your heart toward Him right now? Just say, Dear God, save me, forgive me, cleanse me of my sin, and make me new. I, I confess you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus, and I'm asking you to be the King of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, friend, if you prayed that prayer, let us know today. We want to make sure you have a Bible. We want to make sure you know that as a local church here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, someone is praying for you. We hope to see you soon if you're in the Chattanooga area, and if not, get in a Bible-believing church somewhere and grow in your purpose in Christ. We love you. We're praying for you today. God bless you.